Good morning, everybody. So lovely to see you this morning. Let's put the laptop out the way. And uh, what a great day. The sun is shining. Yay! So happy. <clears throat> I love it. I love it when the sun comes out. Don't you? Just makes you feel full of energy, makes you want to spring clean, makes you want to be outdoors and... Yeah, there's just such happy chemicals <laughs> when the sun is shining. And uh, so it's so good to see you this morning, being Thursday, and uh, loving God, loving our lives. And the Lord has done amazing things during this time. And I'm sure many of you watched the president last night and... From the 20th, the, we will go to level one, which means a lot more things will be opening and the financial system and the financial realm in our nation needs to be rebuilt. And if ever you had a desire to step out into business or deliver some kind of a service, this would be the right time. I think people have come to value community, family, friends, local, caring for one another. It's like the chaos and the madness stopped. And so let us support one another in um, little businesses that will become big, big businesses under the hand of our God. So it's so good to see you. And... Um, Oh, I see some of you have um, have um, business inside of you and Papa's been waiting to release you into this, um, whether it's a coffee shop, uh, whether it is running a caring service of well-trained carers, we don't have to go all the way to the UK. We can care for our people right here. Um, maybe God wants you to start something in from your home. Something that will bring in an income. And I want you to know it's a season of flourishing. It's a season where God is going to take two and two and it's not going to make four. It's going to be 30, 60, and 100 fold. Do not be overwhelmed and do not be discouraged. The word says, whatever your hand finds to do, do it with all your might. I also want to say to you that some of you are amazing teachers, amazing teachers, and are amazing storytellers, and are amazing expounders, not only of the word, the word will be the underlying uh, the, the foundation. But there are families, young children, moms, dads, all of them, looking to check in to something that will give them building blocks of how to move into the future. And um, whether it's grief share, whether it's teenagers. I had a friend. Um, yes, Elizabeth, that's fantastic. She's been wanting to see women on consultation basis to walk a path with them uh, regarding breaking free from fad diets and learning to love themselves. There is such a, a big gap in the market in this, Elizabeth. People will buy, spend thousands, thousands on pills and ways to get thin. And after the first <coughs> 10 days, if it doesn't work, then they're on to the next thing. You can see by the amount of hits on these sites where you've got to listen to a video presentation for oh, sometimes an hour and you get to the end and then you have to sign up and send your money. And Sasha Parker says, please pray for our business. I've also started a business course, very new and exciting to me. 
out of my comfort zone. I certainly will, Sasha, we will back you. I have a very good friend who started a company called Employ My Mom. And uh, it was for women that have children and they've grown up now. They want to get back into the marketplace and they have a professional um, service to offer, whether it's a legal secretary or whether it's um, a BA or dot com or <laughs> commerce degree, I don't know. But man, they, she's placed hundreds of women. Many of them work from home and are able to still be mommies. And that company just took off. And she's been in various magazines and business papers. Amazing. She coordinates people's skills and is a link between people that are skilled and wanting to be used and companies that will employ. How amazing. <clears throat> Yeah, there's going to be a huge gap in the market when people physically go back to work because many, <clears throat> many families have now homeschooling, aftercare. It's going to be a big gap for aftercare. Where do children go after school? And into a beautiful home environment with a step-in mommy It'll just supervise homework and most of all, let them play. If there's anything missing in our society, it's play. Play for adults and play for children. Um, some, a few years back, my daughter-in-law Jess arranged an evening for us girls that wanted to go to rush the trampoline place in Claremont. And I think we were about eight ladies, maybe nine. Did we have fun jumping, running, playing tag, all kinds of things on those trampolines. I had photos of us like -da, in the air. And um, you only know how much freedom you have when you decide to do something you've never done, not done before. The one thing that I couldn't conquer at Rush was jumping into the uh, jumping into the uh, pit of um, foam foam blocks. I could jump in, but man, to get out, <laughs> we were laughing so much, pulling each other out, and it was such fun, such fun. Mm. There you go, Rhonda said she loves 10 pin bowling. Now, I want to say that there's free fun where each person pays for themselves for 10 pin bowling or to go to rush. But then there's business fun. And I saw a lady uh, on Facebook say the other day, she runs these mystery murders in Zoom, on a Zoom platform. 12 people sign up for a mystery Zoom, mystery murder. And then they each come, each come into character on the plot. And I've never been on it, but it sounded very exciting. And she said by the end of the evening, um, the end of the evening, you've met 12 new people. And I do think that there's a charge involved and so you are the one that sets it up and you have fun with those people and at the same time you will make money which is necessary um mcgillie says oh you're amazing i never could jump on those trampolines bruce is laughing he is one uh used to go with the boys <laughs> oh my word i wish i'd kept the photos and the videos it was such fun we even had relay races on the long ones and to run on a trampoline feels like your legs are, um, your legs are in slow motion. There might be people that want to do 
um, on, on a Zoom, uh, people that want to do a course with you. We, um, I wonder where this book is now. I've been rearranging things in my house. Let me just see if I've got it here. Give me a moment. Yes, I found it. Uh, Brave Hearts. This isn't the book I used, but one day the Lord said to me, I want you to write a course of, called Heart to Heart. And I want you to invite women. It was a woman's course to come on a nine week journey. So I chose nine headings. So the first heading was from broken, let's say from, um, from rejection to release, something like that. And my first topic for 40 minutes, I spoke on rejection. And then we would, I would physically have people come to my house and then we would break into small groups. And in our small groups, we would work through stuff. The following one was on shame. That shame is not something you've done wrong. Shame is something that somebody around you has done wrong, but reflects on you as a family, as a wife, as a child, as a church, and how to deal with shame. Um, I don't remember, or, oh yes, anger. That anger is not a primary um, emotion. That anger is the result of unhealed places in our lives. And then it turns into frustration and push down. And then when somebody presses your buttons, you explode into anger. Even Jesus, when he went into the temple and he saw what the house had, of prayer had dialed down to he overturned the tables and he said my house will not become a, a den of thieves i think he said and so um then there's a scripture that says do not allow the sun to go down on your anger so anger isn't the primary sin when there's anger um it's it is um, like a barometer or a thermometer. You, when you use a thermometer to take your temperature. And then when you take your temperature, you know that if it's very high, that something's wrong. And then you've got to go to the doctor and discuss your symptoms. And then they give you medication. And so the same with anger. When I'm angry and I go, I'm so angry. Then I say to the Lord, where is my anger seated? And then the Lord will show me. It's not that person that said something that hurt you. It goes back to a root. And the root is, and I use this as an example now, the root is that you didn't feel heard. It wasn't what they said. You feel that you get angry and frustrated because it doesn't matter how much you speak. It's like your opinion is not validated by the other person. And so through frustration, this root of anger. So I did that for nine weeks. And I built in, because I want you to pick up these keys. I want you to do this. I want you to develop something on this basis that God will show you. And then I, uh, when I completed it, a church ladies group phoned me and said, can you come and do it in Pinelands for nine weeks? I said, with pleasure. And the Lord gave me things to add to this course. We had a bowl, a beautiful bowl that I put a mirror in the bottom of the bowl. And one of the prophetic mornings, that was about self-image, I went, we went and we looked in the bowl as we washed our faces. And I want to tell you, when you're stirring up the water, you just see this broken person in, through the water, through the churned up water. But when you stand back and you have washed your hands and your face, and you let the water settle, you will see yourself. 
And the word says, do not be like one that looks in the mirror and goes away and forgets who they are. One of the other prophetic statements that I used was a six foot or even eight foot, nine foot, I know that it was in two parts, a wooden cross that I had made by my family. And we lived in a house in Fishwick on the mountain and that nobody knew what was going to happen that day. Nobody ever knew what the next session would be. It was once a week. The ladies came up the stairs and I spoke on, on forgiveness. Forgive, give yourself. Hi, Robin Newton, lovely to have you. And forgiving others. And uh, I asked the ladies after I spoke, I gave out paper and I asked them to write a letter to the perpetrator and the offender and that we're going to forgive and give it back to Jesus. And they wrote their letters and we did the prayers and I said, right, now what are we going to do with these letters? I said, I want you to get up and so-and-so will open the door and go into the back garden. And I will meet you there. Take your letter with you and I will meet you there. I, of course, went out with the crowd, but I was at the back. When they saw the cross, they started to weep. Some ran to the left side of the property, some ran to the right. Some went past the cross and onto the stairs that went to the road above, and they stood above and looked down. They didn't know what to do. And I said, yeah, on the bench, I'm putting a bowl of drawing pens. I want you to nail that offense, that little letter to the cross of Jesus Christ. It was the hardest day of the days that they were learning to find themselves. But once they were able to put it on their cross, the freedom was amazing. So when I was asked to do it in Pinelands, we took the cross apart, took it across in the car, <laughs> sticking out the back with a red flag and I went earlier on that particular session and the friend that house I was using knew and I planted it down the bottom of her garden. God did amazing things and at the end of it all we always had coffee and tea and we always left a basket to bless the ministry, to bless the presenter. And it, I had people ask me, I did it in Ocean View, I had people ask me to bring it all over the place. They wanted it in Mitchell's play. Just as people would love a couple to run marriage seminars in various places. I want you to know that people will pay for a marriage seminar, hundreds of rands or pounds or euros. And let me say to you, a lot of these things can be professional. You're running a professional business with a Christian ethos, if I can call it that way. Grace, we might do it on a Zoom room 
we might do a day of encounter, but the nine weeks of heart to heart is packed away. We would have to trust God for something new. And I know he'll show us. But I also want to say to you, Grace, I came to incredible healing running it. Why don't you consider? One day, there was a little, um, a little um, card from the post office to say there's a, a parcel. So I went down and fetched, it was addressed to Word of Life, went down and collected the parcel. Took it to the church office and opened the box. Because now, who is it and what is it for? Opened the box, no explanation. There was books. And there in the top, well, all the books work on counseling and groups and boundaries course. And I went, Lord, where did these books come from? I found out after I worked through the books in groups, we did boundaries. We did what is healthy boundaries and what is unhealthy boundaries. And where our boundaries had been violated, we did it as a, as a leadership team. Where people had violated our boundaries, even as children. And there were hidden atrocities that were now being... Sorry, it was a phone call coming through. And, um, the, it, and so we went through that. At the end of using all the books, I got a message from one of the students at YWAM and said, Rose, did a box of books ever arrive at your ministry? Because I had to give an address. And I said, yes, they are here. I said, we were blessed by the books. And she came to collect them. But how is that? How is God's timing that he just dropped that material? Now, you know that I am not seeking programs to run with people's programs. But we are seeking um, life-giving directive from the Lord to use what is in our hands. When the prophet said to the woman whose um, husband had died, oh, let me, not, uh, let me first say something about this book. So I found this book one day, just not so long ago, and I thought, oh, you know, it's nice to get titles because then you can take the title and then you can build your own material. You don't even have to read the book. And these are some of the titles, The Hungry Heart. And under The Hungry Heart, there are these ed headings. Number one, what do you live for? Number two, a holy desire. And the teaching will be around what is a holy desire. And the third thing under a hungry heart will be loving from a whole heart. Do you know, I could take this page. I could tear this page out. I could leave this page in my Bible. And I could at any time at a ladies or a gathering in a home cell, somebody says, would you like to share? I say, sure, I'd love to share. Go to a heading like this and say, tonight I want to speak to you about a hungry heart. What does it mean to have a hungry heart? God is the desire of our heart. Let's think about scriptures about the heart and about hunger. And isn't it true that the the, the primary thing that draws the presence of God is our hunger and thirsting for Him and for righteousness. What does it say in the Beatitudes about hunger? Those that are hungry and those that are thirsty will be filled. And so nothing can fill a hungry heart other than the love of Jesus. 
And on the topic of a hungry heart, let's work tonight on what are you living for? Are you living for outside gratification or are you looking for, um, are you running an approval addiction? Or are you living to satisfy the desire of the Father? Isn't it a blessing when you come into the presence of the Father and you can feel his smile rather than being driven by people's approval? How do we swap out of man's approval and God's approval? We swap when we understand who God is and who we are in him. And having asked, what do you live for? There is a difference between earthly desires and godly desires or holy desires. The word of God says it's good to desire a place of, of a call in the house of the Lord. That's a godly desire. It's a godly desire to desire an increase of God's gifting and God's anointing. For God's gifting and God's anointing does not bring um, affirmation and approval to you but to the Father in heaven. And point number three under what does a hungry heart look like is loving from a whole heart. If our heart is broken, then our love will not be complete. We need to love God from a place of wholeness, but more than that, we need to love others with God's agape love. Our love has limitation, but God's love is limitless. limitless. So today, I'm still just sharing out of this one thing here. So today, in conclusion, let us resign from approval addiction. That place that every time you do something, you have to ask at least five people, did I do okay? Did I do okay? Did I do okay? The only one that you have to please is your heavenly father. And you will always succeed, although I don't like the word succeed. You will always be significant because your word in your mouth is God's word in your mouth and it cannot fail. So we turn away from man's approval and we delight to hear well done from the Lord. Well, girls and guys, I used those three little points under that heading to show you how easy it is how easy it is to allow the Lord to use you. If you advertise that you are going to help people leave behind their approval addiction and come into authentic living, I'm telling you, they will be flocking to sign up and that was just an example of saying here I am Lord I'm ready to be used of you there's another thing that I've seen done some time ago coffee shop time you speak to a local coffee shop owner and you ask him on a Saturday afternoon or 11 o'clock on a Saturday morning or 2 o'clock on a Saturday afternoon, if you can hire two tables of six. Then I'm just going to open the door. Hello, 
Then you cover those two tables with thick brown paper, like sometimes the pizza shops, even where you buy pizza, sometimes it's that lovely brown paper. And six and six, two tables of six, they pay to come. And you work a topic with them. You could call it who's sitting at your table. You could call it God's creative. And each week, or depends on how often you want to do it, those ladies come for one session. And they will either do collage with magazines, who are you, and some teaching on that. Or you can say it's um, two Saturdays in the month, the same ladies the first and the third Saturday. The first one will be undoing all the myths and all the pressures that they don't need. And the second week would be, the second time you meet would be on identity. Women are willing to pay to invest. You are delivering a service. Do you know that um, some years ago, I took a three month sabbatical just before going into that sabbatical, no, I'm wrong. I, at the end of the sabbatical, when I came back on board, um, I said to the Lord, how do I get started again? And the Lord said, invite friends for a prophetic evening on your couch. And I only in, did it once. And after that, I had groups phoning me. We're a group of four girls. Is that too small? I said, no, come. And every Monday, I would have different people, up to 12, come. I would provide snacks, which I bought at Woolworths. I didn't have to do anything, really, and just put it out in sparkling water. And they would come, and we'd sit and chat for a bit. And then we would begin. I would, be, I would share a little bit, maybe 12 minutes, 10 to 12 minutes on what the prophetic is. And definitely what it is not. It's not fortune telling, da -de da -de da And then prophesy over each one, which we recorded. And they would run home excited. And they would tell friends. I even had a whole group fly in from Pretoria as a team for a prophetic evening. And it was marvelous because the Lord would show me things before they came. And he would say tonight, if it's men and women, even though I knew it's men and women, the Lord would say tonight, I want you to wash feet. I saw grown men with size 10 feet cry like babies as the Lord thanked them for being the provider in their home. People need God therapy. People need God therapy. And then, out of their own, before they've arrived, they would ask me, how does it operate? What do we, you charge? I said, no, there's no charge. Between you, if you want to bless me financially, and I always said financially, I was, I'll bring you a bunch of flowers, and a bunch of flowers is not going to put my, uh, food on your table. And it became the money that came in. I actually never saw it. I'll tell you why. The next group, the Lord will say to me, I want to buy you to buy them each a gift. And I would have a list of names, five people, and never, never met them before, and walk around the shops and say, God, I want to be able to give each one something that is going to be so powerful. The one night the Lord said to me, I want you to go to clicks and buy each person that's coming those little cotton slip-on um, um, slippers. And when they arrive, there will be a bowl of water where they take off their shoes and socks and they just rinse their own feet, step into their cotton waffle slippers, and they stay in their slippers for the duration of the time that you, they are with you and you minister to them. 
I loved it. I loved every moment of it. Because it was not the usual. We have to sing and sometimes I didn't even teach. I just ministered deeply to them and prayed over them. And of course, the prophetic would flow. Maybe you're not prophetic. Maybe you just need to do hands, cream people's hands, wash people's feet and pray for them and pray for them. Some we would leave, I would leave with a piece of cloth over them and say, you to stay there in the tabernacle of God while I move on to the next person. And after a certain amount of time, I would say to the person in the tabernacle, I'm going to move the cloth now. And then I would put it on the next one when I finished. Because it makes it a private space for them to cry. For them to receive. Isn't that beautiful? Dia Diane said, I used to have a singles group at the church. Very, very important. Singles love somebody to invite them out for supper. Not at your home at a restaurant. When I go down to my hideout spots, either Grayton or Stellenbosch, the hardest part for me is eating in a restaurant alone. Singles groups are amazing. And if is anybody that feels that's what God wants them to do, then you should get up and do it. You do not have to have anybody's permission to fellowship. Movie nights, girls and guys going to the movies. That's the other thing. Single people, divorced people and widow and widows. They feel aw awkward because their married friends can be threatened by them. But a fabulous big curry evening at your friend's home, male and female, all just having friendship. Climbing a mountain on a mountain trail, walking in a forest, taking your picnic flasks with you for after coming down the mountain, these are all fellowship points where we build friendship and relationship. Now, this was me just rambling on before I open in prayer, but I think this is what God is speaking about. God is speaking about lockdown is slowly becoming open space again. And we must not be ignorant, sitting on the sidelines, waiting for a strong voice or the government to tell you how to go on now. No. You need to go before the Father with your dream and vision, your passion. There's such a big gap now for you to walk in your authentic call and passion. Do you know how vision works? Vision is setting the, the end goal and then working it from the back to the front. So vision is seeing your group in various settings, one month in a home, one month in a coffee shop, one month down at the beach, uh, one month going away as a group. Maybe attending a conference together. 
becoming a little family, even though you're part of the bigger family as well. And then you say, right, now I want to meet in a hotel conference room because I like that setting. I definitely want to do the local coffee shop on a Saturday afternoon one. Definitely want to do a supper club where all those singles in their various forms can come. Definitely want to plan a weekend away for my, my group of singles and divorcees and widows. And I definitely want an end of the year Christmas party where we will each buy somebody in the group a gift. So I have five things now. So that is my vision. That is my bullet points. Now I have to find an audience. So now you begin to put it out there. You find three or four friends that are with you on board and the one girl the one friend says or the one guy says if you do a bri i promise i will be there to bri for you and i'll bring a, a mate along that's also single yeah i see that catherine reed says tea party let me tell you something there might be Somebody that you know that's going through a financial difficulty right now. And God, because of your passion and gift in this, God may ask you to host a high tea. One lady has to sell a table of 10. You only need three tables. And the ladies on... The, the two ladies, I'll say two ladies host a table of 10. Those two ladies bake scones and a cake and they decorate their table with beautiful crockery. And so eight other ladies pay to come. But you as the baker, you donating your stuff and you setting your table. Then you get a speaker or one of you can talk and you have a marvelous time. You take all that money and you bless that one that is in dire straits. Or maybe it's yourself. Or maybe you're saving to go to Israel. And you can say all funds will go to the trip that I'm planning for Israel. I feel God nudging me to go. Will you support me? Girls and guys, there's no limitation. No limitation. For men on this group, there are men that you will draw that have no body, not body, no body, no pal, to share the disasters that they are going through. I see people like Bruce Frieda men are going to come and talk and spill the beans. I sat in a hospital a year ago with a man that was going through terrible times. Terrible times in depression. And the devil had convinced him that he was in grave danger. That if he, anything happened to him, would he actually go to heaven? That's what depression does. And I spoke it through with him and I asked him some very hard questions. Straight. I said, I'm going to ask you straight questions. Are you involved in this? Are you involved in that? Has this ever happened in your life? Right, let's get forgiven. And then we took it before the Lord and he was forgiven. And he said he felt like a weight had lifted off him. My heart breaks when I have to share with you that he persuaded them to let him go home and it was too early for the medication that he was on 
had not settled in his system and he was battling with paranoia and the first weekend home he committed suicide. Did I feel a failure? No. I thanked God for the opportunity that I had to pray with him and to present him before the Father and to tell him that the Father forgave him and to hug him and to cry with him. If along the way somebody else dropped the ball, there is still no condemnation. No condemnation. People are desperate to be able to share. We need to raise a culture of good listeners. I can tell you another story. You know, as I grew up, and I thought about what I wanted to do in life. The one thing was to be a window dresser on a big store like Stutterford's, where you create beautiful windows that people walking by would be drawn into the store because they saw the display. But my parents weren't able to pay for me to go to a college. So that didn't happen. The other thing that I wanted to do was to be a social worker because I wanted to help people. So I couldn't study that neither. But guess what? I signed up for a course called welfare volunteer program it was connected to lifeline myself and my husband and we did a course on how to care how to counsel we role model play acted scenarios we were given certificates to say that we can now be used in the welfare volunteers program because welfare people go home at five and what happens to the people beyond five o'clock so they were bringing all these volunteers on and i was given a young girl she was 12 13 and her mother was a prostitute and so she had been placed with her granny and been brought up by her granny in a very rundown block of flats in the top of town. And there I was, 18 years of age, going to visit her in a block, I think it was called Constitution Court, <laughs> and giving this young girl the time to talk about her life and take her to a funny little cafe across the road and drink milkshake with her. My husband Lionel had a young boy that he was walking with and it was about being a mentor and a buddy to somebody that was drowning in their circumstances. We then started to, could somebody please tell me the time? I have no access to the time right now. If you can just type up how, how late it is or how early it is for me. What is the time? 10 to 11. Thank you very much, Magelli. And uh, we ran, um, we ran a Friday evening at a home 
for the mentally retarded, mainly um, uh, oh, I've forgotten what you call it, um, Down syndrome, young people. And we would go there and put on the music. Lionel and I had records for Africa. We loved music as we were courting and got married. And, and we would play music and we would dance with them. And they would want to touch your hair and, oh, they're amazing. And we did that for a long time. Then we worked at a place called Home of Safety before young people are placed they placed there to be safe from um, danger. Heartbreaking to see a little child with a spiral burnt on their bottom from putting them on a hot stove. And that was, we did art with them. We made spiders with pipe cleaners and we made pictures with um, rolled up Soviet uh, straw covers and and they loved it but while their little minds were taken up with the art and we start to speak to them their hearts cry is for mommy and daddy even though mommy and daddy abused them didn't that seem crazy and so this is where the church is going this is what the Ecclesia is. It's not a program. It's a place where your heart is full and all you want to do is be part of loving people to Jesus. And I saw that Diane said about people being disabled, going for a walk, you know, with their wheelchairs, etc., etc. And I want to say to you, Diane, there is actually tours to Israel for the disabled. How amazing is that? And how amazing if God opened the door for you to be part of arranging the tours through the people like that. So there's two things that we need to ask ourselves uh, going forward. What do you want to do with my life going forward, Lord? That will fill my love tank, please you, and even supply my need. Because if you seek first the kingdom of God and his righteousness, the rest is going to be added. Those that work the gospel live by the gospel. God will provide. God will provide in unusual ways. So it's time, people. It's time. We cannot stay in our, in our little cloister forever because the doors are about, are starting to open. And now you have to begin to get vision for a new normal. A new normal. And this time, don't get hooked into stuff that you have to do, but don't enjoy because you have to put food on the table. If you find your passion and do it and you're still getting financial remuneration for it, you will do it year in and year out with such joy such joy have an awesome day don't forget what i shared now i can tear this page out i can keep it in my bible i can minister out of these points without even reading the book all you need is something to spark Holy Spirit in you. At the end of each one, there's a little piece that says, it is a personal reflection. 
For personal reflection and discussion, what behaviors and or relationships steal your attention and replace your concern for loving God? Describe how you got to where you are today in your relationships with others and God. When you are overwhelmed by relationships and responsibilities, do you become angry or passive, prayerful, sarcastic or active? You see, you can find little aids to help you work something and when you say i'm going to be running this group for six weeks on a wednesday night dealing with this this and this there's going to be an audience you get vision you get passion you get direction then you find an audience and then holy spirit breathes on it have a wonderful day i will see you tomorrow at 10 a.m god bless you you're amazing